our next session is um, uh, incredibly important, and I'd like to invite uh, the, the, the panel up to talk about home financing. And uh, we will be... Joined by Jim Gray from here at the Lincoln Institute, uh, MJ Watkins. Yes, by all means, uh, let's let's grab a, a cup of coffee, but um, come come right back. Uh, Jim Gray, you you'll you'll be first. Uh, so I guess you could come over here if you would, and then MJ Watkins from uh, TD Bank uh, next to Jim. And uh, <clears throat> and then uh, Crystal Corngay, if, if perhaps has arrived uh, right on time. Uh, uh, Director of Mass Housing, Crystal, welcome. And Chris uh, Herbert from the Joint Center for Housing Studies. Uh, this session will be uh, moderated by uh, Chris Arnold from NPR. And Chris, uh, all right. Another just in time. <laughs> yes, he has been wor working hard on a series of stories he might m <coughs> mention. Um, uh, and uh, we will uh, be off and running with our uh, session on home financing. So, Chris, I'll turn it over to you. Yeah, <laughs> this is just in time. Thank you so much. All right. I'm like those inventories on. Amazon or something. Um, yeah, so uh, uh, welcome to the panel. Although I, I thought I was going to have a little more time to open my laptop, so I. <laughs> <laughs> this is a quick operation here, guys. But that's okay. I also just wrote it down in case of laptop problems. Uh, so, oh, good. Can you guys see this Time Magazine cover? So this, oh, great. Okay. Uh, so where are reporters here for the most part? Is that right? Yep. Okay. So um, the oh, if you could put, yeah, put the Time Magazine thing back up, if we could. Uh, oh no, not that one. Yeah, yes, that one. So right now is a pretty terrible time to buy a house. You know, when we're talking about innovations in mortgage financing, you know, and some of that could seem like, well, look, rates are at eight percent. Prices have gone up what forty percent in three years. Uh, you know. Um, there's no supply. You know, it, it seems like hopeless for people. And anytime the housing market gets weird, um, like after the 08 crash, you start to see reporters doing stuff like this. You know, like, um, does home ownership make any sense anymore in America? You know, and these always kind of drive me insane because the answer is always yes. Home ownership <laughs> definitely still makes sense. It's the, it's the way we build wealth. It's you know, the most powerful sort of forced savings device that for the middle class for a hundred years in America, or pretty close, uh, this has been the way that you build wealth and rise above, you know, paycheck to paycheck. And um, it's still that way. Like, I, you guys probably know the numbers. I don't remember them exactly. But I think the average renter has something like two or four thousand dollars in assets and the average homeowner has two hundred and eighty thousand dollars in assets or something like that. Um, so it's super important, and rates are not going to stay at 8%. They're probably not going to go back to 2.5%, <laughs> but they're not going to stay at 8 And as th and, and we're starting to change zoning laws, and things are going to move, and as you know, the, the ice flow breaks up, um, it's going to be really important to have, to be thinking about, okay, yes, it is hard right now, but so what are things that people can do? And that's what all these guys have been thinking about and doing, um, which is cool. And so uh, we're going to start with Jim Gray. And I think when a lot of reporters think about housing policy and how do we create pathways that are more equal access, and so this neighborhood has access, and you know, um, uh, the Community Reinvestment Act is something that gets pointed to over time. But I think Jim's going to talk about how that's becoming less and less relevant because we think about banks as being the lenders. Um, Wells Fargo Bank or Bank of America, I'll go get my mortgage. But if you're shopping around these days, it's more likely Quicken Loans or something's going to pop up or Rocket Mortgage. So uh, Jim's going to talk about why that matters. Great. Chris. Oh, is your mic not on? Not on. Well, let's try that. Is that on? Yeah. Thank you. Um, 
So the Community Reinvestment Act is something that I think most people who cover housing have heard of. It's certainly a, a well-known tool to people who work at the community level. Um, it's a tool uh, that has been really important over the last 35 years, and it still has an important role to play. But um, as we think about innovations in affordable finance, we need to also think about how the market is changing. And the market is moving away from the banks that are subject to the Community Reinvestment Act. I have just one slide, which maybe, there you go. Oh, wow, they did it automatically. Um, so this is from the uh, Urban Institute Housing Finance Policy Center. You may know, if you don't, you should know that every month they put out um, a whole set of stats on what's happening in the market. It's a huge resource for us. Um, this particular slide shows that in 2013, the share of the market that was originated by independent mortgage banks or non-banks, we're talking about the kinds of banks that don't have a balance sheet, they're just in the mortgage origination business, and every loan that they have to, um, that they originate, they have to sell, right? And, and so they primarily sell them to Fannie and Freddie. So you see on this chart, that we have moved from 2013 to in the neighborhood of 20 to 25% of the market being held by those guys, to now it's closer to 78 or 80%. Um, and that means that 80% of the loans being originated are not subject to the Community Reinvestment Act. Um, but at the same time that all those loans um, are not covered by the Community Reinvestment Act, they're still subject to the rules that Fannie and Freddie set for what loans get purchased. And so the project, um, I have two projects, I'll mention briefly the other one later, but um, one of the two projects that, that we're working on at the Lincoln Institute is called the Underserved Mortgage Markets Coalition. Um, and that coalition is specifically designed to, to deal with Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. And, you know, one of the things somebody said yesterday that I really try to take to heart is that there are certain words that you use in people's eyes just like, and I think Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac may be in that category. Um, so I'm, I'm mindful of that. Um, and at the same time, um, we see the role of this project the Underserved Mortgage Markets Coalition, is to help demystify a bit Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac and make it more accessible for the groups working on the ground to advocate with them, maybe a little easier for people in this room to do stories about them. Um, so we would certainly encourage you to, um, to look at, at what we're doing. So just to go one one level um, further of the onion. Um, so Fannie and Freddie, you know, if anyone in this room were to go down the street today to the First National Bank of Boston and try to get a mortgage loan, the people who you would meet with in that branch would not be the ones making the decisions about whether or not um, you meet the criteria for the mortgage loan. Those decisions get made at Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, and then the people at the bank, TD Bank, whatever, um, will um, just implement that. And so, so if we can influence um, what Fannie and Freddie do, um, I'm thinking back to what Chris Herbert said at the beginning. You know, some of the things that we do have um, more impact than others, but to the extent that we can make a nationwide change that helps reach a particular underserved market, um, whether that's people of color, whether it's people in rural areas, um, we feel like we can have a relatively big movement of the needle by influencing Fannie and Freddie and getting them um, to buy more mortgages. And you know, we're not trying to get them 
to do anything that would expose them to greater risk. Um, the way those companies are organized, they have a lot of incentive to do the easiest loans and they don't have much incentive to do the other loans, even when they're profitable, just because they're more expensive. And so we see that as the role of our, uh, our project. Yeah, and just to underscore, I think um, it, absolutely people hear Fannie and Freddie and we struggle with it writing a story. You're like, well, how do we even define them? Oh, there's got to be a few words. I don't call them, I guess we'll call them a government-sponsored enterprise because that, that's what they are. But then people, well, nobody knows what the hell that means. And, and it's like, you know, it's just this Byzantine thing. Um, but they're incredibly powerful institutions that control more than half of the $12 trillion mortgage market in the U.S., whatever it is. And, um, you know, if you get them to do a little pilot program about something like, you know, and then that can grow, I, you know, like – if you dive into the basement of Fannie and Freddie, like you can find all kinds of interesting stories. So um, that's my right. repeating what Jim said, but um, faster, you know, or something. <laughs> 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 no, that I, not that it, not what it was. Yeah, um, just recapping, recapping. So uh, next we're gonna go to Crystal, and um, uh, who works with Mass Housing, which is a state housing finance agency. and. Um, these are very cool, also little understood organizations, but that have a lot of power and do a lot of interesting things. And um, we're going to hear about some of those innovative ones. And, and one thing that I am interested in that you guys are doing is um, it's really expensive to build rental housing. You know, if we're spending close on to a million dollars a unit to build rental housing that's supposed to be affordable, um, well, what, you know, what if we spent money? Does that mean we should be considering putting more um, resources into ownership in a different way than we thought about before? So what, um, and take that anywhere you want to take it, but uh, there we go. Awesome. I was not planning to talk about that at all, but oh. <laughs> I'm all set. I'm all set. I'm all set. Um, what I, um, Mass Housing simply is the state's affordable housing bank. Right? And so instead of actually um, borrowing against depositors, we issue bonds, taxable and tax exempt bonds. Um, you buy the bonds, we take those proceeds and lend them to people who want to build affordable housing, rental housing, or we actually purchase loans from local banks from homeowners, right? And so, um, and we sell those loans on, to, on the secondary market too, so. <laughs> um, so that's it. Um, just for clarity's sake. Uh, one of the things I did want to talk about actually in this room of reporters um, to help you guys understand um, this thing, we think about the housing finance system as a creation of the market. And in fact, it's not. It's a creation of government. So after the Depression, right, government decided um, that they wanted to create a market so that people could buy mortgages, right? Because before the Depression, you would buy a mortgage, uh, you would get a mortgage, you'd buy a house that's worth is fifty thousand dollars. You have to put twenty five thousand dollars down. You hold that for five years. You pay interest on it, and then you got to pay off the other twenty five thousand. Right? And the Great Depression, all of that collapsed. And so the government created the 30 year mortgage. Like that was an innovation back then, right? It's like crazy. But the government also created all kinds of flaws in that, right? There was a lot of intention in that creation, right? And then the government decided that, oh, the, the folks who were doing mortgages, they didn't have enough liquidity. And so they then created Fannie and Freddie, mm -hmm. right? So that they could have liquidity. So the current housing finance system is a total creation of the government, right? And when you think about all of the injustices and inequities in that system, it is a total creation of the government. It was all done with intention. And so when we ask questions around why is there, you know, home ownership gaps, should you buy a house now, the question is really much more about, I can see that, right? The question is really much more about um, what can the government do to create a system 
that's equal for everybody, right? Because they created this system that's unequal, they can also create a different system, right? So um, I'm not one of those who will say like, this is a terrible time to buy a house. This is a great time to buy a house, man. If I write you a check for $50,000 and you can go get a house, go get a house because I'm gonna come back to you in three years and tell you to refinance that loan, right? It's not about, it's not necessarily about now, right? It's a 30 year mortgage. It's not a three day mortgage, right? It's a, it's a lifelong, it's a, it's a bit of a life commitment. You can sell it, you can do something else with it. And so if you're a homeowner and you're looking to be a homeowner and you can afford to buy a house now, I actually think now is a great time to buy a house. Because five years from now, you're going to refinance that house and have more equity in it than you ever thought. The challenge with buying a house now is you ain't got no money. <laughs> right? And money is really expensive. And so I argue that that's government's role. Right? I just want to write people checks. You get a house. You get a house. You get a house. And we did that with a program that we had um, that we call Mass Dreams. Um, that we called Mass Dreams. We had money from the federal government as a result of the pandemic. They gave us money. And so we said, let's make a program in which we basically wrote people checks up to $50,000 so you could buy a house. You had to live in a disproportionately impacted community, which is basically, you know, where where mostly people of color live. Um, you can probably name all the towns. Um, you had to live in one of those communities and you could buy anywhere, right? And this is in, this was last year in rising interest rate environments, right? How, highest cost housing market uh, in the country. We spent $38 million in 78 days. Right? It's like, because we just wrote people checks, basically, right? We, we, we had the, the state legislature say, it can be a grant. We had uh, the uh, treasury say, well, if you use it for this money, it's a grant. So it wasn't income. It was just a grant. We would just write people checks, right? You get a house. You get a house. You get a house. And all of a sudden, we had 64% of the houses we sold were to people of color. I mean, uh, who bought houses were for people of color, 75% um, were at 100% area median income and below, right? And it just goes to show what the power of money can do for people who make good decisions. And how, how many houses was it altogether? Um, it was a little over 1,200. Um, no, and, and that's, that's great. It's like, you know, and, and I, that is kind of what I was alluding to. <clears throat> if we're going to spend all this money making rental housing, why not take a pile of money and give it to somebody to buy a house? Like, and I think that's a super cool program that uh, makes a lot of sense. Um, all right, so we're going uh, chugging along here with MJ, and uh, we're going to talk about special purpose credit programs, or SPCPs. <clears throat> so... Um, that might sound like it's uh, complicated, uh, <laughs> which it is. But uh, we're going to, you know, I, there's, this is actually an interesting thing because there's been a lot of debate about it. Um, you know, uh, what are the courts going to decide on how you use these things? They've been around for a while. Now they're being used in different ways, um, particularly when you're looking to uh, create more equity and uh, help populations of people uh, who have worse access to, to, to mortgage financing and home ownership. So, um, Absolutely. So let me just start with greetings from North Carolina. I did bring you guys some sun yesterday, but I think it is gone today. <laughs> um, but just as it relates to uh, special purpose credit programs. So these programs, you know, as we talk about innovations, they're not new from an innovation perspective, but they have... Um, come back as a resurgence, if you will, or um, recently had some popularity. When you think about these programs, it's all about opening up the credit box to help increase home ownership. That's what they're there for. So as lenders, you know, we all know that you cannot discriminate based on a protected characteristic. But when you bring up special purpose credit programs, you can bring those protected characteristics into consideration 
when you're trying to close a particular gap, when you're trying to address some disconnects that may have taken place um, from a linking perspective. So one thing I'd like to share with you guys, TD, last year, March 2022, we actually rolled out our special purpose credit program. It's called TD Home Access. Um, it was specifically targeted towards Black and um, Hispanic communities um, because we wanted to increase home ownership there. We understood that there was a need, and so we wanted to specifically address that need. Um, our special purpose credit program, it is targeted. I'm sorry. Oh, it's Jim's mic. He's holding Oh, Mine's oh, off. Mic is too close. Oh. Mine's off. Someone's picking it up. <clears throat> oh, okay. It could be no I was just trying to get you to move it down. Oh, move it down? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Or maybe they just bring the level down a little bit. <laughs> okay. Um, We're going to go run the board. <laughs> <laughs> Got it. So, again, um, with our special purpose credit program, with it having that dedicated focus towards increasing home ownership um, with black and Hispanic communities, um, it is targeted in particular markets. Um, but the one thing is, if you happen to live in that market, anyone can take advantage of it. Um, so again, when you think about a special purpose credit program, it is about addressing any lending disparities. Um, and uh, it's, it's a great tool really to help increase home ownership. And, and maybe just to open this, like, uh, how, do, how do you navigate the sort of legal gray area around, you know, okay, you, you want to help. It's clearly the African American home ownership rate right now is what back to where it was after the 1950s or something. It's horrible. Uh, family wealth plays a huge role. I mean, access to capital to buy a house. There's all sorts of reasons why. Uh, you know, I'm a unbiased journalist, but there's all sorts of reasons why you can see why there'd be a lot of emphasis on trying to make things more equitable. When you get into the realm of you know, look, the Supreme Court, right, just uh, knocked down affirmative action for colleges, is doing all kinds of things we didn't think this court would ever, well, this court, we didn't think the Supreme Court would ever do. Um, how do you navigate doing what you feel is the right thing to do without kind of running amok of, you know, uh, basing lending decisions on race, which, you know, under federal law, we're not supposed to do? Absolutely. And, and you're absolutely right. So we're not supposed to be doing that. But again, with the special purpose credit program that actually falls under Regulation B, we do have that allowance. We do have that allowance that we, we're allowed to be able to do that. So we are allowed to be able to bring in race because we are trying to make sure um, that we level the playing field, if you will, in that particular case. Okay. Right. Yeah, and the other people can answer this question too. Yeah. yeah. Oh my God, I can't stand this. It's like the whole finance system is a special purchase credit program. <laughs> it was designed so that white people uh -huh. could get houses. It's uh -huh. explicit and right. deeds and and construction yeah. contracts. And so now we have to have these special programs, right? So that people of color can catch up. Right, or they have to have some advantage, right? And so, but but what if we, we, the government, all of us decided that we wanted to have a special purpose credit program and, and, and had a whole system for people of color to actually buy houses? We could do that. We know how to do that. We've done that before. We've done that for hundreds of years. And so, mm -hmm. yes, we have to work ourselves around it now we because do. I get it and I'm not... I'm not about that. I just couldn't. I just couldn't. I just can't. First, yeah. Like, oh my god. But what I love about you, Crystal, is you really are so filtered, and you hold back. Yeah. <laughs> um, oh, I thought Chris was gonna say, yeah, and um, and you know, and uh, again. Uh, like you start to get into mortgage finance, and it's like, oh, God, my editor wants me to cover mortgage finance, you know, oh. But there is so, I mean, owning a home is the American dream. It Again, it's the most powerful way we build wealth. It's so important. And as a reporter, if you dig into, okay, what is an SPCP and what's really going on there, I mean, it's super interesting. You know, it's all this stuff. So I would just, you know, uh, put in a plug for, for learning about uh, mortgage finance. Um, and okay, so Chris, uh, big picture, what sort of innovations in housing finance? And uh, you've got a relationship with Freddie Mac too. Uh, you know, with Freddie, Fannie, and Freddie are big, powerful organizations. You guys can do powerful things. 
Um, what are the things that can really move the needle? You know, what, what, what are the things you're looking at? Yeah, you know, um, so I was focusing on the title of the panel, Innovations in Housing Finance. Um, and I, one thing that comes to mind is that we had a whole lot of innovation 25 years ago, and that's called the subprime crisis. So I think we have to approach innovation with a, a degree of you know, clarity about what it is we want to have innovate, who's going to do innovate, and who's going to benefit from it. So I think there's lots of ways in which housing finance would benefit from innovation. And I, I'll break it down in a couple of silos. So one is we need that, and, and the Joint Center had a symposium that David Lubrock did a lot of the work on a couple, of year and a half, two years ago, called Bringing Digitalization Home, and looking at these questions about how do we particularly digitally enhance data, data analysis, analytics to change how the market operates. So one big way is like, how do we expand the credit box? How do we get more people through the door? And so that's like, Things like getting rent reporting and figuring out a way to gather that information and include that in the credit report. It's a way of looking at more like overall spending patterns as a way to assess credibility as opposed to just you know looking at your credit score. So there's a whole lot of ways in which we can expand the credit box, get more people in the front door. Um, that that's important. Uh, although I will say and, and just to explain to it, like the idea there, I think, and maybe this is obvious, but that there are inherent biases in the way the credit scoring companies decide what your credit score is. But, but, you know, if somebody doesn't have a whole lot of credit or barely even uses credit cards or get checks, you know, cashes their checks at the check cash in place down the street, but if they pay their rent on time every month and they pay their car payment every month and you can establish that from their bank records, they might be a perfectly great credit risk even though they don't, you know, uh, score well in the system. But anyway, right. sorry. Yeah. I, I love having Chris up here because he, like, he takes what you said and actually makes sense that I didn't <laughs> So I'm going to speak shorter and give more time to Chris. <laughs> no, no, no. I was translating for a general audience. It's, no, that's that's right. my job. No, this is what I should be able to do because I'm supposed to be able to talk to journalists to get the word out. So this is helpful. Thank you. Um, so, so the other way in which innovation happens, I think, is around the efficiency of the process, right? So we're talking about automating appraisals. We're talking about automating the way in which we, we collect information on employment and these things. And that's supposed to squeeze out costs in the system. And I want to worry about with that, and but let me, well, I'll come back to the other point you made about bias, but what I worry about there is like, well, who actually captures that benefit, right? So if yeah. some new firm pops up and figures, i got a better way of doing this, does that actually translate into the borrower getting that, or is it just lying in the pockets of some tech firm that figured out how to do it? So I think we have to think about how do we make sure that innovation that happens, the benefits flow to the people we want them to flow to. I just to back up a little bit in terms of what you're talking about, Chris, and there's bias in the system. One of the things we have to worry about, too, in this innovation about expanding the credit box and doing new ways of data analysis and data analytics is where's that data coming from? Does that data have bias? Another thing is we're now using machine learning and AI and other ways of analyzing credit risk, right? And the old days when we had a regression model, I could look at the coefficients and say, well, you've got a black variable in there. You know, what's that doing in there? But now we've got a black box machine learning. You know, I don't know what it's doing. It's spitting out an answer. So how do I, as a regulator, understand whether or not there is bias in this or not? So while on one hand, the plus is we can expand the credit box. The other is there's new ways in which bias may come in we don't know about. Um, and then innovation, I think, in, the, in terms of efficiencies, is that we've got to make sure that those benefits flow down to folks. Um, the last innovation is about, I would say, new products. And that's the one that like, my, my antenna go up. Because I think if we're having you know, a new like, rent-to-own product, a shared equity product, right? CDO. <laughs> uh, CDO, yeah, yeah collateralized it. So then, like, going back to the, the subprime prices. But there's a whole lot, lots of new startups now that are going to find ways to kind of deal with the fact people don't have down payments. And, you know, there's that line from the big short where the, the guy goes in and he's looking to buy a CDO and the, and the, the, the investor says, I don't quite understand this, but if you tell me how you're going to screw me, I'll do the deal. <laughs> and so I feel like a lot of times when borrowers are coming in to do these shared equity, you know, deals, it's kind of like, I know you're going to screw me somehow, but I can't figure out how. Now, I don't want to you know, say that all these things are crooked, but, you know, anytime you have a private investor who's going to get a 20% return, right. it's come from somewhere, mm -hmm. right? right. And so the question is, does the borrower really understand it? It, it, it may be that that's a good deal for me, because I'm not going to get in any other way, but if this is a way for me to get in, and then three years later I get out, it may be a good deal. But the borrower has to understand that. The other person has to understand that is the regulator, right? And so we have innovation happening in a way that's faster than regulation can keep up with. And so how do we make sure innovation is actually being done for the good or not? So... I hate to be like Debbie Downer, but, uh, you know. You know, that stuff's super important. We did a story not too long ago um, where there was, I forget the name of the company, uh, but uh, Uplift or something, I can't remember. But they 
you know, had this black box, probably beginnings of AI in there a few years ago. Uh, and they were like, oh, it's going to help people access to credit, blah, blah, blah. But when you, if, if you put in everything the same with some straw borrowers and you put Howard University as the school, you know, a, a versus a predominantly white, equally ranked university, guess what happened, yeah. you know? And it was, you got a worse deal. And it was like, what the hell? And the CFPB, you know, brought the hammer down on them to some degree, and now they're under some sort of a... But, but somebody caught them. But, but it's important. This is the thing reporters can do is you point stuff like that out, and the Supreme Court did not destroy the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau yet. I mean, you know, it, uh, <laughs> but um, if even that court was not too impressed, I think, with the payday lenders' arguments from a, you know, unbiased perspective. But uh, the... Uh, you know, there's so many good stories to do there. Like, you can bust, you can find this stuff. And the company may not even know it's happening. You know, like, it may not even be intentionally. I don't know. But. So, I, just while I have the mic, just, uh, I want to go back to my comments earlier today, kind of framing about incrementalism. Right. And I think um, it's also important in this context to say, we're, we're t talking about, you know, a 30% of black-white home ownership gap and uh, innovation housing finance to close it. I, I would say that we're not going to, we might not even close it by more than a percent or two. But, it's not unimportant, right? And so what's the difference between getting a Fannie loan and an FHA loan? You, you get access to cheaper capital. You get access to more robust uh, uh, um, protections, right? Um, if you get a cheaper mortgage, it's not, not that you, you, know, you may buy a home one way or the other, but you get a cheaper mortgage, you build equity faster. Your, your leftover money is, is, is lower. Um, the other way in which innovation is important is it's one thing to get into home ownership. It's another thing to stay there. Right? And so one of the things we need innovation on is how do we help people when this shit hits the fan, right? And we have mortgage insurance, which is great, because you're an investor, that's what we're insuring. But if you're a homeowner, that doesn't insure you. So how do we have innovation to, to have people stay as homeowners and succeed as homeowners? So I think we spend a lot of time thinking about getting people in the front door, I think we're gonna close the gap. Think about where, how do we make sure this is better, make it more, you know, it's a better deal, and then they stay there. Sustainability is so, just as yeah. important as affordability. Yeah. So, so um, Chris, I think you made a couple of really good points there. Um, and uh, one thing I want to build on, that where you were sort of comparing Fannie Freddie to HUD, you know, if you, I, I need to have a slide on this for my presentations, but if you were to look at the racial composition of the HUD portfolio, FHA portfolio versus the GSE portfolio, you would find that the GSE portfolio is almost exclusively white, and the FHA portfolio is almost exclusively black. So we have a, we really have a bifurcated system where black people use FHA and white people use the GSEs, and you know that can't be, that can't be what we want. I don't think. Um, and uh, another thing that you said that I want to lift up is. Um, the business about the credit scores. And so I don't know, Freddie may have followed on this, but Fannie does deserve credit for having established a system where the rents that people pay can now factor into their credit score. Do you, has, you know, has Freddie done that? Yes, yes, they have. Okay. Yeah, they, they, <laughs> Fannie did go first, but they followed. And they, they're doing that, and they're also um, in their multifamily apartments uh, having rent reported to, to help build their credit score. So I suppose if I'm applying for a mortgage, what happens is the system will say, you either got to you know, get a green light or a yellow light, the way the system works. Right. It says if you get a yellow light, the system will also set up a little flag that says, oh, by the way, if you have a payment history of you know, on-time rental payments, then we can change this yellow to green. Mm -hmm. And so you as the underwriter should say, go, go and check that. If you can bring, bring us information on that. What's important about that, too, is that it doesn't... You know, if we check everybody's credit, right, we find out a lot more people of color have trouble paying rent for a host of reasons that have nothing to do with whether or not they're credit worthy. We start denying them a lot more credit. So having the system work so it's like it's up to your benefit but not to your detriment is a way to also involve, you know, avoid getting too much bias built into the system. Right. And, and just a final point that, that I want to make and a refrain here is that the way we change the system is primarily through Fannie and Freddie because they control such a big part of the market. So, you know, if you want to get um, a system that now recognizes um, your rent credit into in your credit score, well, when you get Fannie and Freddie to do it, that's when the system changes. And that's why we at the Lincoln Institute feel like it's so important 
And we hope that you all will pay more attention to what Fannie and Freddie are doing and how they're, um, how they're continuing to, to evolve our mortgage market. So should we open it up to questions from folks? Mac. I don't need a mic. All right, so um, my, mic's on the way. Mic, right? <laughs> All right. I'll start anyway. So one of the things that uh, the one of the most recent innovations, which isn't really an innovation in mortgage markets, is um, lots of attempts now to grab onto future appreciation of the housing through the structure of the the mortgage instrument, precisely the shared appreciation mortgage, which in almost every case that I've reviewed is predatory as hell, right? And one of the things that I think we really need to do a better job at, and I think we definitely need journalists' help with this, is distinguishing between what we call shared equity housing and shared appreciation mortgages, because those get confused all the time. And so I don't know if any of you have shorthand ways of actually distinguishing those two things. And then, Crystal, I'd really like you to say something about there is one example that I've seen of a shared appreciation mortgage that actually is very beneficial to the borrowers, and that's the one that you guys are using in that very generous program that you were doing to build new housing and get people to be homeowners in tough places in Massachusetts. So, mm -hmm. so Crystal, if I can, maybe before you answer that, just jump in to clarify. One shorthand way of distinguishing is that shared equity is when the price is restricted so that it doesn't go up as the market would dictate. Shared appreciation is when um, there is some sharing, the, the price isn't restricted um, and the price goes up, but there's some sharing of that appreciation either with a public entity, which is usually a little better model, or some of the people that I think Chris was referring to earlier. When Chris, you used the word shared equity, <laughs> So Lauren Berlin, um, I don't know if she's still here today, but she was one of our moderators yesterday, is actually writing a paper uh, for us with Grounded Solutions Network that will provide about a six or seven page explanation that will hopefully be a good tool for people. And as soon as that comes out, we'll be sure that the folks that were here are aware of it. But, Jim, no, I think that you're, you're talking about, like, community land trusts or deed restricted housing. Yeah. There are shared equity programs that are private for profit, right? So I'm gonna, I'll am gonna give you 10% towards your home in cash. It's not a mortgage, right? It's, it's down payment. So this, I can't remember the name of it, Landed. Well, we, we call that shared appreciation. We, we do not consider those types of things to be shared equity. But it's not a mortgage, right? It's it's right. a it's a it's they have an equity stake in the property, right. and with that they get a piece of that's the, right. Piece so and all those things when the interest rates went up, all those things went away. Right? So now, now we've got they may come back, but right. But we're not having to deal with that right. right. Well, so we just confused everybody because we're all going to clear ourselves. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> Thank you. I, mean, I think a shared appreciation mortgage is a mortgage where the the payment that you get on that mortgage payment is tied to the appreciation, and but it's a, a debt instrument. No. But no. All right, I need I need the lesson on this. Too. All right, Mac, but I know we want to take this offline. Yeah, you can right. you can educate me, educate me. Yeah, yeah and and you know the uh, terminology aside, you know, for reporters who don't cover this that deeply, this is one of those things that makes me crazy. Like when I first heard about it, it's like where I started in my little intro today was. Home ownership is the most powerful way to build wealth in America. If some private company comes in and steals half of your upside because they gave you ten grand, you know, twenty years ago, to, that just is that. I don't. I don't like I, that. Should well, I have to be careful. <laughs> it's, certain people find that uh, objectionable. <laughs> but, but Crystal has a shared appreciation. Okay. Of, uh, okay. Yeah. yeah. I, I, I don't know if that's exactly what it's called, but if he says that, that's what it is. And so um, we have always taken the approach of um, addressing the racial home ownership gap, which, uh, to get to something Chris was saying earlier, is not going to happen if we don't make the federal government make it happen. Right? And so um, these things, we got to do incrementalism. I'm not mad about that, but I'm also not believing i don't believe that that's the way we're really going to get at this so um but 
uh, in between, we think about uh, demand side and supply side, right? And so demand side was this uh, down payment assistance program we were talking about, I was talking about earlier. Mm -hmm. And then there's supply, right? It's like, you know, it's great if you can get a down payment, but what are you going to buy? And so we, um, uh, with some uh, assistance from the legislature, created this program that we call um, Commonwealth Builder with the intention of having it be a tool that increased supply in communities of color and did it in a way where people can build wealth, right? And so um, we have a mortgage, and we started out with this mortgage um, with this deed rider where it was like, you know, it was going to last for 15 years and then it was going to burn off, right? You could have, um, there are, it's, it, it gets complicated, but there are adjustments to how much you can sell it for, uh, for the first 15 years, and then it was going to burn off. And part of the reason we changed that was because it was so expensive, right? And so it's public money. And so it cost half a million dollars, $600,000 to build a house that you want to sell for two, three hundred thousand dollars $300,000, right? Like, that's an automatic kind of investment in folks. And so we thought that we should have it be a little longer um, uh, and got into that with folks about what that meant because it becomes this thing around, are you trying to stabilize communities or are you trying to build wealth? And I always say, we're trying to build wealth, right? Like, if that's your first thing, right? Like, we have to do things with intention. Um, um, and municipalities also want to have it be longer um, and we say to them well when the deed burns off if you want to keep it affordable then you have to buy that right that's not a thing that you should put on the the seller or the next buyer um, and so that is a little bit about uh, what it, it's very new the program so it's not like I can have examples of how it's working on the street but I have examples of people who are buying homes in communities that they lived in because nobody builds uh, or sell homes in communities of color, right? They just don't do it because you can't sell them for what you can in other places. Mm -hmm. Question. Um, you guys have been talking exclusively about innovations in financing for home ownership, but we also have these giant challenges around financing affordable housing rental construction. And so I wonder if there's any like particularly new or interesting idea that we're not aware of or that we could use more education about that if you guys could speak to the rental piece a little bit. I'll say to you, um, you know, the biggest uh, subsidy for the production of affordable rental is run out of the IRS, <laughs> right? And so it's a tax program. Right, and it creates public private partnership, and you know, and all that. You know, you know, government loves to say that it's a public private partnership where really the private entity is getting all the game, right? And so it's like, um, it's so you know, like, how do you improve on that? Because that's basically right a way in which private entities get to put money into things, right? And it becomes, in some ways, just a grant to the development. And so there isn't any, I mean, you know, this is this is finance, right? There isn't anything, right? You have debt, you have equity, right? And either way, um, if you can't get enough debt, your rents don't do that, then you got subsidy. And so how does the government come in and do that? And so that's just, you know, that's just trying to figure out what that is. At some point, we have to have a finance system in which we're not maximizing return, mm -hmm. right? because that is not working for everybody, clearly, right? And, and until we get to that place, you know, home ownership, rental, whatever it is, isn't gonna, isn't gonna really get to what we wanna see in the country. You know, what comes to mind, I think, is uh, building off what you just said, is the example of Montgomery County that Connor Doherty wrote about it a few weeks ago. Yeah. So and that's a situation where you have, it's, it's, you know, the county is becoming the equity investor using debt using a, a, public, a bond of their own to do that. 
And so, but that rather than require a 20% equity return, they're only requiring a 5% return, right? Mm -hmm. And so and they're in it for the long term as the owner. And they're not in it in the long term to make money. They're in it in the long term to have housing that's affordable. So, I mean, when you ask about, I, at first I was stumped. I was thinking, we don't really have innovation <laughs> around rental houses that I know. Maybe Jim does. But I think this is a model that is actually pretty interesting and, and looking to be expanded. I understand is that Atlanta has, housing authorities created a nonprofit to do this. Chicago's looking to do it. Kenzie Bach in Boston is looking to do it. So I think it's a model that could expand, and it's interesting because it creates a new pathway outside of LIHTC, right? So talk to anybody in the space. LIHTC is the juice that makes everything go, and there's only so much of it. Mm -hmm. And it's complicated, and there's a lot of people making a lot of money off of it. So we can create a new model, and this one I think is pretty interesting. Yeah, I guess I'd say the headline is that the system that we have, and this is going back to what you were saying earlier, Chris, there's just not anywhere near enough subsidy to create the rental housing stock that we need, right? And so that's the headline, you guys. Um, but in terms of just one other thing that I can add, that probably uh, I'll defer to Chris, as maybe that's the, the more innovative, but as part of this project that we have in the Underserved Mortgage Markets Coalition at Lincoln, working with these 35 other national affordable housing groups, um, Part of the responsibility under duty to serve that Fannie and Freddie have is to do more to preserve rental housing. And so we're, we're trying to be aggressive with them um, on that. And they haven't really stepped up and done as much as they are capable of doing. And so, you know, again, that's kind of my refrain is look at what Fannie and Freddie are doing and that'll give you a clue of um, where there's room for or at least incremental movement. Hey, thanks so much. Um, so I'm curious, I, I think a couple of weeks ago, FHA came out with this uh, new rule, uh, which would allow or require uh, income from APUs to be taken into account uh, uh, for mortgage origination, I believe. I skimmed the press release, so I'm probably getting the details wrong, but uh, well, so yeah, so what that what happened was, um, and sorry if I sound like a broken record, <laughs> exactly. but Fannie like Mae yeah, yeah. had Rip. had done this. Um, Fannie Mae decided that that they were going to change the rules for how manufactured housing is appraised. So um, in the before time, which is like less than two years ago, any time a manufactured housing unit. Um, was appraised that the appraiser appraisal industry insisted on using other manufactured housing, not site built housing, as the comparable. Mm -hmm. And so Fannie Mae, after a lot of bludgeoning by our <laughs> other project, which I haven't really had a chance to go into much, but my colleague Erica Young will talk about this in the next panel in more detail. Um, but <clears throat> so Fannie Mae agreed to change it, and now. And, then Fannie Mae said, okay, we will um, say that, that site-built comparables are appropriate for new manufactured housing that is of such high quality that you can't really even distinguish it from uh, the manufactured and the site-built. So what FHA just did a week ago was they said, okay, we'll do the same thing. And you know, this is consistent with that point that most of these things happen first at Fannie and Freddie and then FHA and the rest of the industry will follow suit. But your, your point specifically, too, is that you can get uh, credit for the income you're going to get for the ADDU to help yeah. qualify for the mortgage, which is interesting because if people are having trouble affording home ownership right now and you build a small ADU where the garage is, that brings in income and helps you afford and increases the supply, which will bring down prices or help them from stopping. I, mean, I think all that's, ADUs are super. I mean, it's not gonna solve everything, but right. super interesting. No, I was just gonna say his question was about ADUs. I think uh, not about manu uh, manufacturing housing, but I mean, I think the thing about ADUs too is challenging is that, so I'm, I'm a homeowner, so there's one thing to be able to get credit for the income stream, but I still got to get a rehab loan, right, against the, the future value of that property. So I, I'm not familiar with the FHA product, but I, I, it may be if I've got an ADU, then I can count the income stream, but how do I get it? How do I get a loan that says, okay, so I got a $200,000 house or a $300,000 house, I'm going to put a $100,000 ADU in the back, so I need a mortgage that's greater than my current house value to support the placement of the ADU in, in, 
So like in the future, I'll have that income stream. That, that is what it is. 203k. Yeah. So that's a rehab loan. And is, have they, Mac, have they fixed that? Is that that? That's what they're fixing. That's one of yeah, the right. Oh, this was it. Okay. But so you know, in fairness, uh, so I'm sorry if I sort of jumbled those, but the current FHA leadership is the best leadership that we've had in probably anybody in this room's lifetime. And they are doing so many things so fast that um, it's really hard to keep track. And, um, and, and also, ADUs and manufactured are pretty closely linked because often ADUs are manufactured units. Oh yeah, you wanted to ask about, go ahead. Uh, th th this will um, move the conversation in a slightly different direction, but then we can always come back. Um, uh, uh, and that is to ask about uh, this notion of social housing of good old fashioned public housing, some sort of return to that. Uh, uh, there was uh, a, an interesting account in New York Times Magazine, looking at Vienna, other places in Europe. I mean, God forbid we look at Europe, but uh, is that possible here in some way? M Montgomery County was sort of characterized uh, along those lines, uh, or, or you know, is that just a non-starter? Um, I'll take a stab at that. So I, I think we have to take a, a stab at this, but I think the first thing we have to do is define what social housing is, mm -hmm. and we might need a whole session to do that. But I'll take, well, I, I would two. say with two, two sessions. Two. Uh, I think one, one thing, is, so first of all, mostly what we're saying when we're talking about social housing is we want to say public housing, but we can't say that because that's so reviled, right? So we have to come up with a new term, and so that's where social housing comes from. But I think, I think it's public ownership, either that or... It's nonprofit ownership that is permanently affordable outside of the traded market, right? So that's the, the key feature of it. So Montgomery County is a version of that, which is really interesting, right? Because it's happening outside of any other kind of you know, subsidy program. So it's not, it's not even tied to any of those restrictions that public housing would be. So really interesting model. The other thing about it, I would say, is mixed income. So the thing that makes it more social, that's part of where the, the name comes from. It's not just for the poor, it's for, for a vote all the way up the income ladder. And some conceptions, I would say, it also crosses boundaries between rental and ownership. So you're going to have some of this as a, the ownership model. Um, we absolutely need to have it. So this is about, my, uh, Dan ordered me in a bar last night, got on my soapbox about this. But this, go, this so yesterday, my colleague Dan McHugh put up a slide that showed what's happened to incomes and house prices over the last 60 years. They're just growing further and further apart, right? We got 11 million renters paying more than half their income on housing, and we think that we're going to fix zoning and make a little innovation in financing and solve this? No, right? Because what's going to happen 60 years from now, those lines are going to be further apart. So what do we got to do? We got to get enough housing for those 11 million people to be able to afford housing, and it's got to be outside the private market, because most of that increase in price is land prices, right? And so if we get that out of the market, and you have good housing that's well financed, over time, we can actually start to have housing for those 11 million people. So we need to have this conversation. Uh, we need to have a name for it that doesn't make people think it's socialist or Swedish. Or like, I don't know what that name is yet. <laughs> These folks that work with Montgomery County, the Center for Public Enterprise, are calling it Mixed Income Public Development. Um, it's got a, so we, we don't have a good name for it, but I think, we absolutely, I, I think this is a really super important development that we have to find a way to make it work. Yeah, this is the this is the next frontier in affordable housing development, as far as I'm concerned. Um, how the public invests its money, because one of the things uh, that's uh, one of the many challenges of uh, public housing is, you know, we like to build things, but we don't like to take care of them, right? We expect them to, you know, take care of themselves, right? We it's why our transportation systems all are challenging. It's why our roads are all challenging, right? We like to build stuff, but we don't want to invest in the upkeep of it. And public housing is the same thing, right? I mean, amongst a, a lot of other things that's wrong with it, but, you know, it's public housing. So, you know, let's let's give them $5 to run a $7 program, right? It's like, and, and then you want to know why it's all jacked up. And, and what we do is we then blame the people who live there. Right, because we can't actually have a challenge of a problem with ourselves, and so the thing about the government building housing again, I don't think we should do that. Right, that is just fraught with all kinds of that would be fraught with all kinds of opportunities to do bad things. 
But if the government uses its money to invest in housing differently than it has, or not differently, but in addition to the ways that it's been investing, I think that I think that is the next frontier for um, for housing development. And uh, speaking of Europe, I mean, does anyone of you guys want to talk about what's working really well that we could learn from Europe about this? We don't have to call it the French housing thing, you know, for certain areas. Can I just say one of the things that challenges me uh, about when we talk about Europe, right? Like people say, oh, in Japan, they do this. And in Vienna, they do that. In Japan, they build affordable housing for Japanese people Mm -hmm. in Vienna. They build affordable housing for Viet- Austrians. 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 <laughs> right? But in America, because we can't decide what an American is, we we have this whole problem with affordable housing because we think it's for those people, right? And 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 we don't think it's for Americans, right? And so that that in and of itself starts this whole problem with why we can't do what they do in Japan and Vienna. So, we got a question in the back. I'm interested in, in your all's thoughts about getting people lower value mortgages, like around under $100,000. I've heard that's kind of an issue that pops up from time to time when people are, are trying to buy their first house. Jamie, you want to talk about that? Um, that, that is definitely a, a big issue. It's something, it, it's an example of what I was talking about earlier about um, Fannie and Freddie tend to gravitate toward the things that are the most profitable, not necessarily the things that are most needed. And, and so um, low value mortgages are, are definitely something um, that need to be, I'd say, pretty high on the list of innovations in finance that that we need to push the system to do better. I mean, it, is this working? Um, it, oh, it's working. Oh, it's, got a hold it's just, yeah. just me. <laughs> um, I mean, I do think you have to recognize that one reason why it's so hard to get those mortgages is because the cost of origination is so high. It's not just Fannie and Freddie. It's the originators who are going to say, why am I going to spend as much time to underwrite a mortgage right. that's, uh, that's going to you know, gonna get, because you know, their fees are based on the mortgage balance. Right. As a, as a higher balanced mortgage. So we have to figure out some way to subsidize that process that we think it's important or streamline that origination process so it doesn't cost ten or $15,000 a right. loan. Right, so the servicing fee, you know, a loan is really what its value is in the market after it's been originated. So there should be some some give on the servicing so that, that low, um, low balance loans um, have greater value, right? Right, but the servicing does cost money, right? Yeah. So if you if you still cost as much to service a fifty thousand dollar mortgage as it does a five hundred thousand dollar mortgage, and my fee is based on two percent or three percent, whatever it is of that mortgage, yeah. so those, no, it's not just a say. You, know, you still have to cover those costs somehow, right? So so there's going to be some cross subsidization, but we have to figure out who's going to pay for that, right, in right. order to make it work. Right. And, and what, what is the market, like with the demand side of the $100,000 mortgage when the median income home is like north of $350,000? Um, I, I just don't even know, but like what is this mean buying certain areas where houses really are still cheap or, or you get a big down payment or what, what's the scenario where that? I mean, um, if you're... If you're watching, like, if you watch HGTV and you watch like Market Block, right? A lot of the houses, a lot of the houses in Detroit that they sell are around one hundred thousand. In Detroit, yeah, yeah, one hundred thirty thousand dollars, and so, but that's not, but all, that's not it. Like, if you saved up one hundred thousand dollars and you're buying a two hundred thousand dollars house, or on, if you saved up two hundred thousand, you're buying one hundred thousand dollars. It's hard to get that hundred thousand extra hundred thousand dollars to get right. over the hump to mm-hmm. actually purchase a, purchase a home. Okay. Yeah, and then also. Yeah, yeah. Like and that's that. what I was yeah. going to say. Also, in some of your rural areas, you'll definitely see those price points that's much lower. Um, from a TD perspective, we absolutely do those loans. Um, and then also from a home equity perspective, we reduced our minimum um, loan amount from twenty five thousand down to ten thousand. So, what do you all do to incentivize the originators to to do that? I mean, we have a minimum commission that they're paid. Ah. So that's a see. There's a great answer, yes. right? He said you got the subsidy. Yeah, <laughs> and that kind of is the subsidy. That's it. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, yeah, did you have a question? Okay. 
Um, I was curious, uh, Crystal, if you could talk more about um, the, the Mass Dreams program. Like, I would, you were talking about the importance of not only housing someone, but helping them stay as a homeowner. And I was curious if you guys are monitoring or keeping in touch with the folks that you gave the, the money to and sort of seeing how things are going after that process or if there's some sort of like data collection. I know that's a huge problem in California. But sometimes we give out money and then we don't really know what happens afterward or, or if the programs are actually helping people or if they need to be tweaked in some way. So I'd just be curious to hear about that. Sure. Um, in order for you to actually get the grant, you had to get a mortgage from Mass Housing as well, right? And so, and we service our own loans. And so we always know what's going on with you. And we are in the business. We describe ourselves as in the business um, sustaining homeowners, um, which is why we do our own servicing. Um, and so, you know, we want to keep track of you if you're, you know, if you're late. I am, um, this is a, this is the part in the, in the presentation where I say I'm not just a hair club president <laughs> because I got my first mortgage through mass housing as well. And so, um, so I know that their servicing is like that. If you're late, they actually call you and it's like, Hey, you're late. And so, you know, because, um, it is, it is much better for us for you to stay a homeowner and current and it's worth the effort to, um, make sure that that's happening. So. Can you talk more about the decision that you made? I hear this all the time in my work, the tension between the deed restrictions, um, 30 years, next buyer. Can you talk more about how you made that decision and why? Sure. Um, because we started out saying that we wanted this to be a wealth building tool, right? And so then decisions you make after that are how does this contribute to wealth building, right? Um, and so, right, because again, wealth is, um, it's like assets are, are a thing, but you don't actually build wealth until you sell a house, right? And so um, so what, what makes it easier in that moment for you to capture value that's, uh, that's been created? Uh, and so we just, uh, the deed writer, most most of the deed restrictions that happen um, are thirty years plus. Um, you know, like cause in cause in Boston, it's actually in perpetuity, right? Because it says it's thirty years, but every time you sell a house, the clock starts again. So everybody who owns a house, right? So they put in money, they build a house, they subsidize it, and then they get affordability forever, ever. I actually in Boston, that's okay because even with restricted um, value growth, Boston's uh, growth uh, growth in our home values is so high, mm -hmm. even a restricted growth is better than, than nothing. But in Springfield, that ain't the case, right? And so we just wanted to make sure that, um, that we were balancing what it meant for to use public dollars, right, to make people homeowners and create that equity and allow them to create that equity. I don't, you don't look like I answered your question. <laughs> well, so Chris, why don't you talk about how you think about gentrification and um, how that influences how you do that? Sure. Um, again, we start out with wealth building, right. right? And so you have, you know. But in Springfield, right? right that you're not as worried about. I'm not as worried about that gentrification. in gentrification in Springfield. And, but I'm also more worried about wealth, right? Right. right. And so MJ owns a house. She's owned a house for, you know, 20 years. She wants to go retire. Her house is her asset. She wants to sell her house to, to capture that value Right? And so she can go retire back to North Carolina. <laughs> right? And, and so gentrification, you know, behind that says, you know, a little bit like, well, we shouldn't have MJ do that. Right? Because, you know, that creates a problem for people who also want to live in a neighborhood right. and blah, blah, blah. 
And so there's a little bit of, you know, there's a little bit of like, what is the right balance, right? right. Because yeah. MJ has lived in that neighborhood through the crack era, through the opioid addiction. She got bars on her windows <laughs> because she's lived through the neighborhood and watched it become a place where other people want to be. Yeah. And now we're saying she can't have the value of that. Like that, that is just, that's not what you say to people who live in other neighborhoods. Right. right? <laughs> and gentrification, like, you know, MJ is like, the cops come now. I can get an actual not rotten tomato in the, in the grocery store, right? right? It's like, we call that gentrification. I actually call it betterment. <laughs> I ain't mad about it. The problem isn't that it's gentrifying, the problem is we haven't figured out those 11 million people. Who are renting, how to give them opportunities to stay in that community, right? And the way that we want to do that is to place the burden on other right. folks without us saying, you know, why don't we just write them a check so they can stay here, right? And like, why don't we buy MJ's house for market value and then turn it into a thing? We don't think about things right. like that. I, I'm going to try to channel my inner Chris Arnold and, and boil this down. So uh, Crystal had made me rethink my thinking on this, right? So I would. So to Jim's point, I think we've often thought about we maybe, maybe it's like me white people have thought about shared. Oh my God, you're white. <laughs> <laughs> shared equity as a community strategy, right? Which yeah. is a community land trust, and what we want to do is preserve this community and have it be affordable over time, and that's a value, right? And what Crystal is saying is that there's another value that says right. people of color in particular who've been left out of this for generations and centuries you know, need to get theirs, right? And so why are we going to say that community benefit outweighs individual benefit? And Crystal's saying, nah-uh. And so, you know, and as I think, I, I had her in my class and we are talking about this, and I was like, huh, so I, I better listen to the woman of color <laughs> who's telling me about how to, ba how to balance these two things. So I think, I don't know, Mary, if this is, you know, like the challenge is there's no right answer, right? 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 The challenge is what, which one are you valuing more? Right. And Crystal is saying is I think we need to make sure that the individuals get to build wealth because we haven't done that for a long time and the community will figure that out. Right. right. And the thing I don't, I, like, you know, when we talk about community equity, community value, I can't send my kid to college on community value. I don't know what that is, right? It's like when my uncle gets sick and I need to take out a home equity loan, I can't do that on community value. What is that? And so that's the kind of thing where I'm saying, no, we got to start to, until you create a better system, this is the one we have, right? And so let's, let's do everything we can so that wealth, uh, you know, goes to the home by homeowner uh, in communities of color. Could you just, Jim, could you just say something about standardizing deed restrictions, though? Because that is an innovation yeah. that would matter, right? Yeah, yeah, that, that's a great point. So, ex not disagreeing with anything that you said, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and maybe hearkening back to the conversation yesterday about deed-restricted housing. So, w one of the things that um, has been uh, a project that we have been working on with Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac is creating one deed restriction that would be for the whole country. So what, what often is a barrier to creating deed restricted products is every community has a different deed restriction. And while you need to have flexibility within the deed restriction to reflect the economies of the local market, the, the rest of the terms of the deed restriction being different makes the lender pull her hair out because she says, oh my God, it's, you know, it, it's different in um, every community, even in the state of Massachusetts. So, so by leveraging the, um, the standardization power of Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, um, which has actually already been done um, with um, a ground lease, a standard ground lease, that was done 25 years ago, uh, but that only applies to community land trusts. We could make all of the, what I'll call shared equity, meaning the price-restricted housing, um, have the same uh, terms, and, and that would make a tremendous difference in making this sort of housing more uh, in greater numbers and more readily available. So one of the things about the deed rider we talk about, the, mostly when we talk about the deed rider, it's the ter long term of 
of the term of affordability and the sort of rate of value growth, right? But one of the things that happens in um, that happened in the city of Boston's deed rider was if you bought a deed restricted home, you passed away, right? Mm. You had to sell that house to a, a, a different buyer. If because if your child was an income eligible, right. your heir couldn't get it. Right? And so it's just sort of like, it's little things like that yeah. Yeah. that we fought against. It wasn't just about the growth. It was about, like, you know, like, how could you talk about, you know, generational wealth? And you're not even letting the, gener right. the generation got to be poor enough to actually get the house. <laughs> right? It's like, so it's, it's not just those things. It's all the things that go into that kind of thing. And having a standard right. would make that all, you know, go away. You see the backwards. Oh, um, so related to mortgages and wealth building is the appraisal system, and um, there are not enough people of color who are appraisers. And I wonder if you all have um, if that factors into some of the work that you're doing. I don't know why you're looking at me, but <laughs> so you know, I, the, the biggest thing I think that we're dealing with in appraisals is how it's becoming mechanized and there's less and less that is in the purview of the individual appraiser yeah it would be great to have more people of color as appraisers but we got to pay more attention to that um, it's really an AI system that our appraisals are being determined by Yeah, I don't. Uh, this is not an area of expertise, but I, I, I would say is that the process is uh, we have to think about what the process is for getting appraisals approved as appraisers, right? And so my understanding is now you have to apprentice for a very long period of time without pay, and so what it turns out is that the only people who will become appraisers is the child of an appraiser, right? So I'm going to bring Crystal around with me; she follows me around for a year. So you end up having this thing that's like a family business. So, and the, the appraisal industry is regulated by a private company that was yeah. kind of chartered by Congress that does their own thing. It's like, I didn't know this at all. I'm like, how the hell does this make any sense? <laughs> so, you know, look at the appraise, like, and the chickens are, the foxes are in charge of the hen house. <laughs> so, there are work, there's work going on underway to try to diversify the appraisal industry. It's going to take a long time. So, I think, and I think Jim's point is just well taken, which is that it is the old technology. And more and more, we have to think about the ways in which the new technology is going to work and what the biases are in that system, right? Yeah. And how are they finding comps and where those comps are? Because that's even harder to root out in some ways if it's, again, in one of these black boxes. Hey, do you guys think playing into that problem with the inequity in appraisals, it, you know, after the big housing crash and the subprime craziness and, you know, what was happening then, AmeriQuest would, you know, have their appraiser guy you know, like he did any number they want you know the house can be worth 500 grand i'll say it's worth 500 grand and so to interrupt that i mean they all had like three appraisals in their back pockets every single guy pushing those cheesy loans um so now you got this new system where it's like all right you need an appraisal um but then it goes into some black box and some guy from worcester gets told which is like 50 miles that way, you know, come into Jamaica Plain where I live and tell me how much my house is worth. But he doesn't know the neighborhood. And he's, you know, he's wearing like sweatpants. He's half asleep. He's like, oh, you know, and and then it's like, uh, you know, this isn't like the best system either at, versus like people who really knew the neighborhood and what houses were worth. And it feels like somebody coming in like that is going to make judgments about the race of the people who own the house or you know if they really don't understand the neighborhood it maybe it just makes all that worse or maybe i'm making all that up and no it's not a problem but like uh, do you guys have any thoughts on how that i don't know if it's still working that way and is it creating problems or crystal you you actually work in this business or, or mj do you? yeah no, they don't want to talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> like mj that's what i'm Smart. talking about mj um well, no, it is true that MDEC, because our our um, our lending is really different in the sense that um, we have income guidelines and so uh, home price guidelines and so is not really the wild wild west. A little bit is um, that one of the things that we're advocating for in the 
the state is doing a housing bond bill, which they do every five years. One of the things that we're advocating for is a home ownership production tax credit, and would you kind of get a tax credit to make up the gap, mm -hmm. right, between uh, appraised value and construction value, right? And, and, and rather than have a cash subsidy, have it be, you know, a tax credit, uh, that somebody can get the value of to, to kind of get <coughs> added to that. But, um, but as the system moves towards something that's more uh, mechanical, as I was describing in the beginning, like, you know, the appraisal system is another innovation of the government uh, that happened after the Depression, right? And when they created this whole system. And so I worry a lot about the black box because whoever's making the black box definitely isn't black. And so, you know, and so they are programming all of their biases into it, right? And then the people who are regulating them are, pro you know what I mean? And so I worry a lot about that, but um, it's not, I, c I can't do everything. <laughs> that is the best quote of the day, by the way, just for <laughs> Yeah, that is. But there, there probably is something to be said on the other side for taking some of the human uh, part out and making it a little bit more standardized, right? Yeah. I mean, the, it can be screwed up, yeah. no question about it. Yeah. But I think the general direction of having less individual human judgment is going to be for the better. I, I, you know, I like humans. I ain't mad about them. <laughs> yeah. I, I, you know, I, I, you know, I just, I, I, I don't think you can take humans out of it, right? Yeah. It's like, I just don't. Um, it's a fallacy that we're all telling ourselves that AI is going to artificially no, tell. Right. It's artificial. <laughs> right? It's like, so I but just. But I guess maybe what I'm saying is more standardized way as opposed to. It um, is. It is already pretty standardized. Yeah. It's just you know. It's just. It just only works for, anyway. Certainly. Yeah. yeah. Well, Jim, on on the appraisal side, like. There were a bunch of stories about like these home buyer companies that would just from remotely decide how much a house yeah. is worth. Right. It works in like Arizona where you've got right. 500 of the right. same house. Right. But if you go to Jamaica Plain where you've got homes built over 100 years in varying right. states of repair or disrepair, you know, some are two families, some are triple deckers, some are, right. and, 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 and then that creates problems because for a while the two families were selling as kind of junkers, but maybe one was fixed up and it was really nice. And then, ooh, the numbers didn't work if you just looked at it in the well, standardized it's even way. It's worse in a rural area, right, where every house is different. Yeah. 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 And then I think you need people, right? right. Like, a, right. you know. That's just one other thing I want to say on the appraisal issue, which is this is a huge issue in racial disparities and appraisals. There's, there's, there's you know, documented evidence that there's racism happening. That said, I think we have this distinguish between the bias that's happening in the appraisal process and the segregation and bias in the housing system, yeah. right? And so you hear, see a lot of reports that say, oh, these black houses are appraising for this much less than white houses. That's because of segregation and racism in the housing market that houses on the south side of Chicago are worth so much less than houses on the north side. Hey, don't blame the appraiser for that. Right. So, and so I think we just have to make sure that we separate out right. when we're talking about appraisal issues. What is it a housing you know, segregation issue in which it is the, the appraiser screwed up? Um, I'm Andres Figlucci from the Miami Herald, and this may be completely out of left field, but something that in Florida certainly is very broadly affecting housing affordability uh, is insurance. Uh, it, it, and the market is completely broken down, and I mean, somewhere where innovation is badly needed is, is the insurance market, especially as climate change advances. Um, and I understand something similar or analogous may be happening in California with fire insurance. Uh, but we have people getting, you know, 20, 30, 50 percent increases year over year in their windstorm insurance. And of course, your mortgage banker is not going to allow you to go bare unless you've paid off your mortgage. So I'm wondering if anybody's starting to give uh, this some thought. Any of you guys thinking about that? I just interviewed somebody the other day dealing with that. Uh, but. I didn't have any genius answers. <laughs> um, we are starting to think about that in relation to affordable rental housing because it is uh, certainly impacting the cost of operating that and therefore 
Um, so we don't have any bright ideas, but it is, uh, it's, it's on everybody's radar at the moment. Yeah, I, I would say that one of the issues that um, is struggling to get this to get the attention it needs in some ways is that who's bearing the risk, right? And so I just know at the GSEs, there's all this talk about, oh, this, you're facing all this climate risk. But the GSE is looking and saying, you know what, given all the coverage we have, you know, when there's like a hurricane hits New Orleans, we don't lose that much money. So we're not too worried about it. It's the, but it's, so it's the homeowners on the hook, right? And so um, I think there's, there's questions about who's, who's incentivized to worry about this problem too. More and more the GSEs are worrying about it, in part because if it goes away, then there is no, no backstop for them. The other thing that happens that's interesting to think about too is that in a state like Florida, say somebody pulls out, there's, there's like a state backstop insurance, but it's not as good. And so suddenly the, the risk that's being passed on to the lender is a lot worse too. So um, there's, you know, you bet, you, having insurance doesn't mean that you're actually well covered either. Oh, um, yeah. Hi, uh, I'm Rachel, I work for Vox. Um, I guess I like just reflecting on this uh, conversation. We all cover housing and we all can like pick different angles and stories to write. And I think writing about innovations and financing for homeownership is like, a, that is an important topic. Like what are the things that um, you know, federal government or local governments are thinking about. Um, I, I like, guess I do want to say I feel like this has been um, very boostery of homeownership and in a way that like, doesn't feel very journalistic of like, we should be questioning if homeownership is the right policy vehicle. We should be looking at actually how it's worked for wealth building and especially over the last 15 years. And I feel like, um, like there's, it's always been the case that it can be good for some and it's not good for others. And we're not financial advisors, but it like carries very different levels of risk. And I think reporting on people who like want to expand certain opportunities to open up courses of access, that makes sense. But I, I feel very like a little uncomfortable by the idea that it should be conventional wisdom and accepted in this room that like we should be encouraging people that to purchase homes and that that would actually be the best even like wealth building opportunity for them. Um, so yeah, and I think like there's there's just a lot of <laughs> evidence to the contrary of that. And that's, I guess I was- What is the evidence to the contrary of that? Uh, okay, well, I mean, I think we can, there's a lot of people who've been pointing this out. I was like rereading through some dentists had a good po uh, article, you know, it's an argument, but I think it's an argument that we could like discuss in a, in a panel of informed, <laughs> smart, curious people. Um, uh, her, uh, sort of the question of whether, I, I don't really want to go into like making the case against home ownership now, but I want, I certainly feel comfortable saying like, there are lots of reasons why, like we shouldn't be in our role, sort of like pushing people down that path necessarily. It's like saying everyone should go to college and that's not necessarily the right individual decisions of people. Yeah, certainly. You know, I, I think there's two things there that I'm hearing, and you guys, we can, but, you know, um, since the issue of journalism was brought up, uh, you know, the, um, it's not always the right time to buy a house for everybody, right? I, I mean, uh, people shouldn't buy a house when they're young and they're going to move and they don't have the money and they need flexibility. And there's a, you know, but there does come a time in our American financial system where the numbers do show pretty clearly. I mean, you know, we're not robots, you know, and especially now, by that I meant, you know, people will argue, uh, well, if you took the money, you would pay into the premium for ownership over renting and socked it away into an index fund. But we, you know, behavioral economists would argue, well, we don't actually do that. You know, the, we, we pay our bills and we pay our mortgage. And so over time, you have the potential for an appreciation and you have forced savings. And it's a hedge against inflation because, look, the last 12, would we have 8% inflation, 10% inflation. And I locked in my mortgage rate at 2.5%, and I'm paying effectively less than I was five years ago to own my house that I've owned for 20 years. And I have five times the equity that I owe on it. And the numbers always just come back. Um, you can find a scenario where somebody, it doesn't work or something went wrong. But the numbers are just so powerful. Again, it's like the average assets of a renter are like four grand and the average assets of a homeowner is like, I don't know, $300,000. I can't remember exactly. It's a massive difference, you know. Um, and look, I'm all for, we should have the conversation. I just resist the, op, you know, what's on the cover of Time Magazine. We're telling people, 
you know, oh, maybe you shouldn't own a home when it is like such a powerful way to succeed in this country. I, I just get very cautious about journalists taking that tack. We got this, this gentleman's had his hand in the air, like it definitely wants to get in. So I feel like. Yeah. Uh, Rosh and Abraham Spice in Next City. Um, I think to what Rachel was saying, there is a disconnect between this idea that like home values and home values going up are the way to generational wealth or to like, you know, liberation for certain communities. Um, but there's a disconnect between that and the idea that property owners of multifamily housing, for instance, also own property. And, you know, when those home values go up, it has a negative effect to what you were saying about renters. And I think part of the problem that we're not discussing is that um, home value shouldn't be people's like, you know, property value shouldn't be people's retirement fund. You know, over the course of decades, pensions disappeared. <coughs> um, There's less unions. Wages went down. Um, you know, people's health insurance costs are going through the roof. So what we're seeing is people using their homes as their retirement accounts and landlords using their properties, even small landlords, as their retirement accounts. You know, and it's, it's like I talked to so many people. I talked to so many renters of small landlords, not giant corporate landlords, whose landlords just freak out at the idea of not spiking the rent every time they have the opportunity to. Why are they doing that? Because their property to them is what's gonna you know, help them in old age when they're, you know, there's no home care system for them. You know, and like the, the property, properties have essentially become people's retirement system and I don't think that's a good thing and like I don't know what the solution is right now right here but it is there is kind of an issue with like you know talking exclusively about home values as if they're you know yeah. uh, I want they to also turn, have to go up a term of the panel you know I don't think it's an either or right there you know especially when rents are just as the same price as owning it's not like you're making a choice between your retirement account and owning but you know go ahead I I, I um I hear this question as as this right there's there's wealth right what are the various ways in which people can have wealth that's not a home and we should be talking about those as well and we don't right um that is okay um and conflating home ownership with with it as the only thing to do is is can be problematic Right, because it makes people want to do things, right, that maybe aren't in their own best interest, right? And then there's home, right? Is the home part of home owner? Because you gotta live somewhere, and why not live in a place in which you know the whole economy is organized so that so that a home owner gets the actual benefit, right? And so. Um, you know, we think about the biggest subsidy the government gives to people. It's the mortgage interest rate, right? It's like the interest rate reduction, right? It's like we're giving subsidies to people to own homes. We're doing all kinds of stuff around that. And as journalists, what? let me just be clear. What I want, what I would love is for you all to write about how the government has created this system and can uncreate it. And so instead of saying, should you buy a home, right, the question really is, how can the government make it easier for you to buy a home, right, and stop actually, you know, making those, th those decisions around that. So I respect that it isn't only about home ownership. We should be talking about how people, you know, use their pensions. What does that mean? We should be talking about, you know, baby bonds. We should be talking about all kinds of things around wealth and equality in this country. We just use home ownership as the shorthand for that. I just, um, I just want to say that I appreciate your, your comment, and I, I think we you have a really biased panel here. Yeah. So, you know, <laughs> if we had somebody uh, else up here, and they could, like, grab the mic and, and sing your song, uh, I'll try to sing a few bars of it. Which is, you know, there's all kinds of risks in home ownership. It's an undiversified asset. Prices don't always go up. You know, you can get foreclosed and your credit score is ruined for seven years. You may not want to cut the grass or mow the lawn, you know, do all those things. And so there's lots of ways in which home ownership is risky, and we should not forget that. And I think we have to be careful about making a normative statement that one should own a home. 
Now, the truth is that most people say they do want to own a home, so I think we're not necessarily foisting it on them. But I think sending the message that thou should own a home, we have to be careful of. We really have to be careful of that thou, as a person of color, should own a home, because we have found six ways from Sunday to screw you over the last 50 years. And so what I would say is if we're going to push home ownership, we've got to make sure that we have all the safeguards in place, that you buy a good home, that you have a safe mortgage, that you get invested over time, that when the shit is the fan, we're there to help you. Mm -hmm. And with all those things happen. Now, to your point, all those things may not happen. And so we may be putting people at risk. And so we got to be careful about that. But to what all these other comments are saying, too, I do think we don't actually have a good system for building wealth otherwise. Now, back to the social housing point. If we had a whole social housing system and I could get a rental that wouldn't go up over time, then I could take that money and actually save it like Chris said I could if, you know, if I should. So part of the answer is have a really robust social housing sector that people don't get kicked out when your income goes up and that we can start having the better ways of having stable, secure housing too. So you're right, it's risky and we shouldn't oversell it. And so it's my short answer. Yeah, and that, that, that absolutely makes a ton of sense, you know. Um... Oh, any other questions? Uh, Mac, do you want to end us with anything? Or, uh, no, well, I'll, I'll, I'll end us. Uh, thanks for a great panel. Um, we got a lively discussion. And the reason I put that thing up in the beginning is it does kind of create, you know, uh, discussion. So that was part of my idea. But um, anyway, thanks for coming. I hope everybody enjoyed it. And um, have a good rest of the day. <laughs>